Toronto stands on the edge of the Great Lakes that once were an even greater sea. Slowly, the layers of silt on the seabed became compressed into rock. Later, the towering glaciers of the Ice Age added their weight, compressing and carving the rock till they melted northward, leaving behind them the Great Lakes. Since the glacier's retreat, some 10,000 years ago, the rock has been slowly rebounding from their weight, for rock is elastic. Something to keep in mind when building a tower higher than the loftiest of those ancient glaciers. feet, over three quarters of it was built by slip forming, a construction technique where concrete was poured into an open bottomed mold that outlined the walls of the tower. As the concrete in the lower part of the mold hardened, the whole 600 ton slip form, including the crane, was moved up. The concrete pouring was continuous. of these self-climbing jacks lifted the slip form, the ends of the mold crept inward, leaving beneath the slip form the tapering walls of the tower. and trades had to learn to communicate. And that's what all the concrete was for, communication. Good morning. The date is Tuesday the 3rd. This will also get quite a bit of sunshine today, mixed in with coffee. Not just for two million or more Torontonians, but for places where the commuter trains don't run, and as a link for nationwide communications. foundations, narrow holes reach more than a hundred feet into the rock, a legacy of the geologists' appraisal prior to excavation of the site. On their last trip down, they had set steel rods in the rock to gauge how much it would spring up as excavation removed the load. And now, how it was settling back under the growing concrete. Twenty-two feet of it every 24 hours.
slip form shrank in size, the iron workers were constantly tidying up. Trimming back the steel guides that had served their purpose in making the concept of the tower reality. With slide rule precision. The graceful lines were for the eye. The smooth exterior for the high-speed elevators. The tapering legs for tree-like stability. Just one of the structural engineer's safeguards, along with foundation that flex like a foot, spreading the load on the rock when the tower leans, as all towers do, from expansion of the side warmed by the sun. To concrete of unique strength and 500 tons of reinforcing rod, a third strengthener was added. For concrete can be prone to a simple force that has demolished mountains ice, expanding in hairline cracks. By threading sets of steel cables from top to bottom of the concrete and placing them under permanent tension, the hazard of ice cracking the concrete was eliminated. The biggest concern was for vibration from high winds. This tap equals a hurricane of inconceivable force, yet the tower soon dampens the vibration. Calculations were based on a thousand years of weather at its worst. their own decisions, pushing the tower up, far from the help of those below. But the crane was the real clue to how the schedule went. Apart from concrete, everything must go up by crane. when the crane hung motionless, riding out the storm. Days when the schedule stood still. In the site office below, they wondered, what if we have to pour concrete through the winter? Up top, it was winter. Tapering legs were complete, and with a simpler slip form, the rate quickened. We have passed the Eiffel Tower. We are on top of the Empire State. Not far above us, New York's Trade Center. And then, only Moscow's Ostenkino Tower to go. 
The tower's height is dictated solely by its communications role. But up top, they can be forgiven the exuberance of crossing off another rival. Sometimes it seems as if the earth turns about the tower. Actually, it's the slip form that's trying to twist like water down a drain. A natural phenomenon that taxes all their efforts to keep the tower straight. We are very worried about uh, acrophobiacs and uh, exposed immediately to the uh, really incredible view. The most significant display is uh, the telescopes, so that it's an ideal opportunity to operate a very high-powered zoom lens and uh, achieve a sensation of, being, of flying through space. With only a few feet to go, the tower deviates only 1.1 inches from the vertical. are a little short. This ship would like to top off the concrete, but a troublesome steel bracket or a photographer at your elbow doesn't help to say nothing of the weather. Then, it was there. Somebody said, I guess we should open the champagne. It seemed a long way down to that hot and humid night last summer when they had watched the slip form make that first memorable inch off the ground. And now they faced a similar problem. How to position the brackets for the sky pod over a thousand feet up the tower. Weighing almost 400 tons, the 12 brackets must be lifted simultaneously. Up top, the slip form gave way to a crown of steel that would support 45 jacks. Hand over hand, they would haul in the cables, rolling the brackets up the concrete. Everything was ready to go. The temporary legs are severed. The cables took the strain. 44 of them, that is. The 45th slipped. Some modification of the jacks was needed. There was time for a breather. Time to unearth a few more reminders that not so long ago, this had been Toronto's waterfront, shared by citizenry and commerce alike. to the people.
firmly in place, architect and engineer felt justified in visualizing the curving patterns of steel and glass that would be added in the coming year. Around the brackets, they would add a sophisticated inflated donut to protect microwave antennae from the elements. On top of the brackets, level two would be an open air observation deck. On level three, the viewer will be enclosed from the elements, but not from the uplifting experience that comes with being part of the cloudscape. On level four, diners will be able to perambulate 360 degrees of visual and gastronomical delight. Above, communications, where images and sounds from a dozen television and radio stations will be transmitted with newfound strength and clarity. concrete would be the upper observation level, where right now, with the brackets hardly in place, they face the problem of perching 300 feet of steel antenna. The answer was a helicopter that would pile the preformed sections of the antenna on top of each other. The sky crane was a veteran of many construction problems, except perhaps a Toronto winter. It was a chilly stay of execution for the crane, who through two winters and summers had served so well. The trains went about their business, uninterrupted by the signal that would clear the tracks during lifts. Cameras were focused and refocused. All they needed was a glimpse of the sun. Section by section, the crane came down and the antenna went up. The downdraft, not that bad. The cold, unbelievable. Some of the pieces weighed around 18,000 pounds. The job had been planned for a maximum of 16,000 pounds. The thick, cold air allowed them to lift the additional weight.
heavy sections with the dampers, a hula hoop arrangement of lead weights and springs that dampen vibration of the steel. a little late at the site. This last section was the longest section over 30 feet of it. The target now, only a few feet across. The weather threatening. Until the top, it carried a thousand indelible reminders for those who had built the tower of who they built it for.